Hi, everyone. If you already join, welcome. Uh, so far, I see we have uh, 26, uh, 26 participants. Uh, let us just wait for a few minutes. Uh, wait for other people all join, and then we can start today's session. Okay, so now we have a, oh, one more in. Now we have 31 participants and uh, now it's already three past three London time. Uh, so we just start this session. Uh, if you already see on the screen, you probably, probably already see the newsletter as well. Today we have a very unique topic and we'll have a, a very honorary guest speaker here, uh, Zilton Andrews. Um, we'll talk about uh, uh, methods for learning from the occupants perspective. So how we can co-design with the uh, people who are actually using and living inside the building. That, that's today's topic. Before Andrew start uh, his speech, I will quick um, introduce oh, my screen now. Yeah, um, this webinar uh, hosted by uh, International Building Performance Simul uh, Simulation Association Education Community. Uh, the purpose for this kind of uh, series um, um, webinar just uh, identify the education and the training needs through the whole community related to the uh, simulation performance. And also, we want to develop and encourage uh, people who use this kind of new knowledge and uh, methods. Uh, to do the simulation in building design. And the training session is not just for our member, it's also for non-member, non so it's open for everybody. So we we'll, welcome you invite your colleague and friend uh, joining the session as well. And uh, today is our series session. We also have a other coming up session. Uh, today is number four, then we have a coming up session uh, on the 18th, of April, 6th of May, uh, for, for, uh, 14th of May. So keep your eye on this kind of session, uh, but you need to register uh, first so we can send you the webinar link. And uh, also we have uh, another series that is not uh, about uh, occupancy center design, it's about uh, urban building energy modeling. Uh, there, there is another webinar will coming on the 21st of May. So if you're interested about that direction, uh, please register as well. Yeah, without further ado, I will uh, pass this uh, time to um, pass the floor to Silton and uh, you can start your speech today. Thank you very much, Wow. Uh, I guess I, you'll stop sharing the screen so I can start. Okay. Yeah, okay. all yours now. Great, thank you. Uh, welcome folks. Uh, we are uh, going to be 
not trying to do the full screen projection. Uh, we had a little bit of an issue in the um, warm up period. And so I'm just going to click through the slides as you see them right now. Anyway, um, uh, the topic for today is obtaining the occupant perspective. And this is based on a, a, a chapter uh, in a new book, which is uh, the basis for a lot of this, uh, this uh, webinar series this year. And uh, uh, so the work that I'm sharing uh, was co-authored uh, with Julia Day and Philip Agi and Rich Wenner and Quan Jin and Jennifer Senek and Liam O'Brien. And um, uh, what I hope to do with you today is give you a little bit of motivation for why would I want the occupant's perspective, talk about uh, how uh, designers and operators of buildings have different information needs uh, at different points in the building life cycle, because that's going to be important in really thinking through what should I do now. Uh, there's uh, uh, some important stuff. Uh, this is this is the hardest stuff, really, um, in thinking about the nature of occupant data and methods for acquiring that data. And uh, as a little bit of a glimpse of where we're going, uh, I've put this uh, odd cover of James Clifford's famous book uh, on the right hand side, which shows uh, the anthropologist's dance that was developed by um, an, an indigenous group uh, who noticed that there were these people studying them. And so therefore they started to incorporate the studiers into their own culture. And so uh, that type of hermeneutic is gonna be uh, one of the essential challenges as we get into the nature of occupant data and how to collect the data. Um, uh, there are some very practical things I want to mention regarding the occupant and professional relationship between uh, you as professionals and building occupants. And uh, I want to offer some comments on data reduction strategies and then wrap up. So that's uh, where we're headed. And so to start with motivation, um, it's something that's been true for thousands of years that building designers necessarily make strong assumptions about occupant needs and comfort. We have to think on behalf of the occupants we des are designing for. And so we're going to be guided by, you know, our clients' priorities and by government regulations and by what are the standards and the norms of our industry and what does our prior experience suggest. But in fact, through all of this, we are doing what Norman Rockwell illustrated so nicely in this um, uh, magazine cover from the 1930s in the middle of the Great Depression. And that's that the real person and the ideal person are really pretty different from one another. And we often are going to be creating idealized versions of real people, simplified versions. Uh, rational versions of people that are going to be somewhat different than the, what they really are. And so we're going to want to keep track of that. Um, and so that also begs the question, well, are there some direct roles for occupants in the design process? And is it possible for us to imagine working with occupants rather than on their behalf? This is a little bit of a change in mindset from the way most of us are trained. And so if we wanted to do that, how would designers obtain the occupant's perspective on uh, the building challenge? And so I mentioned that uh, what we, the ways we would engage with occupants are going to be different at different points in the life cycle of a building. And so, you know, you can imagine the life cycle extending from conceptual design to schematic design, design development, construction documents, contract administration, and into occupancy and, um, the long lifetime of a building. And so, you know, at the very earliest stages of conceptual design, it's important to consider, well, what types of occupants are gonna be in the building? What are their needs? Uh, and uh, how can we coordinate with other team members uh, as we establish their needs? Uh, as we move on to schematic design, it's gonna be much more about thinking through 
well, how will occupants actually use the space? Are smart device ne devices needed? Some kind of signaling system, perhaps? Are we imagining that all of the controllable features like windows and lights, are they gonna have active or passive systems of control? And uh, as part of this, we're gonna realize that it's important to pay attention to the nature of the interface that occupants use to control the different aspects of a building. In um, design development, uh, here we're gonna be working with owners and occupants if they've been identified and think them about, for example, a tenant engagement strategy. Um, and to think about the different ways in which uh, people are likely to inter, uh, interact with building management systems and to develop really clear goals for how do we want that engagement to occur. By the time we've um, arrived with construction documentation, uh, now we need to codify all of this. We need to write it down, make sure that the expectations and the goals and the strategies are evident in the specs that we write. For example, if this is about uh, sustainability, uh, then we're going to want to have cl green cleaning specs and energy efficiency uh, uh, strategies. And as we uh, do this, we're going to realize that there are engagement strategies that we're going to need to engage uh, to have owners and tenants buy into. And uh, you know these need to be feasible and dual. So it's a lot about guideline development. And in contract administration, you know now we are pretty far along and we're trying to set future occupant expectations for how they're gonna engage with the building. What should they do? What shouldn't they do? How can we coordinate and manage, manage expectations? And finally, in the long twilight of post-occupancy, uh, uh, these are opportunities to implement post-occupancy evaluations, um, put together tenant engagement strategies such as feedback and education and motivation, um, maybe even gamify it a little bit. Um, think about brown bag lunches, you know, lunch and learn types of things, uh, blog posts and email blasts, um, uh, developing training, you know, how to be a good occupant, how to be a good operator. Uh, and plan for engagement throughout the life cycle of the building. Okay, now the challenging part in um, a lot of this is recognizing that occupant data, which we want, uh, can be hard to obtain and it's not necessarily what we're used to using. Um, and that's because there's both a subjective and an objective dimension. And so objective evidence, you know, we can, uh, we can see the occupancy patterns, you know, are people there or not? We can measure indoor conditions. What is the temperature? What is the humidity? What, what are the indoor air quality and the lighting levels? We can track occupants' behaviors, their adaptive responses to these conditions. We can even measure physiological effects. You know, is that person's, uh, experiencing heat stroke because it's so hot. But there's also a subjective dimension and uh, where we recognize that different occupants are going to uh, subjectively experience things differently. And uh, the same objective temperature and humidity levels might elicit different perceptions of thermal comfort in different people, depending on you know their metabolic rate and their um, uh, how much clothing they're wearing, and whether they were expecting it to be warm or cool. Um, there's also going to be a, a sense in which the degree of control people have over their environment is going to influence how they feel about it, how they perceive comfort levels, and how satisfied they are with the experience. And people, uh, in addition to their revealed preferences that you can uh, objectively measure, they're going to have expressed preferences, which are going to uh, reveal something about how they think about the world and what, um, what they consider important. And that um, extends to the fact that people have mental models of how buildings work. 
and uh, that might be different than how they really work. And so uh, we need to be comfortable in accepting that there are some objective measures, people can agree on how many oranges are on the plate, but there might be still subjective differences that uh, cake on the plate is delicious. No, it's not delicious, it tastes terrible um, because people have different uh, subjective uh, uh, perceptions and preferences. Okay, there are further challenges in using occupant data that get to the problem a uh, fundamental problem in the social sciences, which is that both the subject, that is the researcher, and the object of study, the occupant, are people. And all people are subject to social forces. And um, uh, uh, you know, heavyweight social scientists ranging from Anthony Givens to Jürgen Habermas to Andrew Sayer have weighed in on the problem of the double hermeneutic. The fact that uh, both uh, the, the way we observe people is influenced by our social conditioning um, and the way people behave when they know they are being observed uh, is also subject to social forces. And so uh, that makes our data a little bit less pure, a little bit more contingent. And so the solutions uh, in this space are to be pretty humble, and uh, especially regarding what we think we know about people. And uh, where we can acknowledge objective agreement on the material facts of the physical world, we should pursue that agreement. But when it comes to what people are thinking, we should really let people speak for themselves as much as we can. It also means that we need to study people in their physical contexts because that governs so much. And you know, there's both a social context, such as is illustrated by these two examples of um, a man and a woman wearing proper clothing for their circumstance and time and era and location, as well as the physical context of, is it a workplace or a home? Is it winter or summer? Um, what are the expectations regarding you know, climate, climatic conditions? Lots of challenges here. All of this fits into strategies that we need to develop. You know, it, it's never gonna be one method that rules them all. It's gonna be about mixed methods that allow for triangulation on the truth. And so we're gonna want to be comfortable using uh, measures that I've grouped here, you know, self-report measures, such as questionnaires and interviews and focus groups and diaries, um, which have quite different characteristics than observational methods, such as behavior tracking, mapping, instrument-based data collection, photography and videography, which are different still from unobtrusive um, observational measures. Uh, such as looking at uh, the worn places on the carpet to indicate the level of traffic uh, through a, a room in the museum, or of course, archival type of research. And there's also um, a, quite a variety of qualitative of approaches that include participant observation, you know, uh, uh, being there in the room with people and thinking about how we feel. Now, in terms of assembling these individual methods into strategies, uh, I want to offer uh, three different archetypes here. One is what's known as an explanatory sequential research design, where we start with quantitative uh, methods, uh, such as uh, counting people. And then we interpret that uh, with the aid of qualitative methods, where we ask people, uh, what do you think that quantitative data means? And together, those allow us to interpret what we think is going on. And that uh, has a quite a different flavor than an exploratory sequential research design, where we might start saying, we don't really know what's going on, so let's ask people, let's do qualitative work. That's then going to lead us to some refined questions that we could perhaps uh, do survey uh, research on or, or set up instrumentation to measure. And uh, in that way, we can 
uh, develop interpretations that are a little uh, more informed uh, from our exploratory uh, kind of starting point. And finally, I, I wanna offer a convergent parallel research design, which says, let's take the streams of data, the quantitative data and the qualitative data and bring them together in a true triangulation effort uh, to interpret what, what we think is going on. Okay, so with that big picture, let's dive into some of the um, uh, types of methods and measures. And these I hope are familiar with, to many of you. Uh, interviewing is a very powerful tool. You know, essentially it's a guided conversation and it's great for eliciting um, an understanding of questions about how and why, you know, why are you uncomfortable? Uh, uh, how do you think the building works? And it's also going to be highly dependent like any conversation on being able to establish a personal rapport, uh, being able to make the person comfortable so that they'll answer honestly and fully. And so interviewing is a skill that can be learned. It's a skill that's taught. Uh, every university has uh, coursework in how to do interviewing and every graduate student in the social sciences learns how to do that. Uh, not as many architects and engineers go through that training, but it's available and uh, you should definitely pursue it. It's widely useful. A focus group is more than just trying to interview a bunch of people all in, at once. Uh, they're certainly part of that and it requires you know, advanced planning uh, so that you have uh, guiding questions and uh, follow-up prompts to keep the conversation going. Um, but it has the additional value, if you can pull it off, that it's going to allow you to uh, learn about multiple perspectives, different people's perspectives on the same issue. And in that sense, the most important thing you get from a focus group is often by observing the interactions among the participants as they respond to the questions that you throw out. It's going to be less about how they respond individually to you, but to how they respond to one another. A couple of more self-report measures, which I, I think people are uh, largely familiar with. One is um, uh, using a diary. You know, these days they're often online diaries, but certainly it could also be a piece of paper or a, a little uh, uh, lockable notebook with a, a tiny golden key that you put on a lanyard around your around your neck, and you know the idea here is to ask people to reflect on uh, uh, their day or their week. Um, one uh, thing that means is that it's going to be vulnerable to what they do remember, um, and their recollections might be imperfect or biased in some way. And certainly recollection is limited. Uh, your memory fades pretty quickly. And so it's probably reasonable to ask, well, what, what happened today? Tell us about your day. Maybe it's reasonable to ask somebody, what happened this week? You know, did you um, tell me about your schedule for this past week? It's gonna be completely unreasonable to ask somebody, what were you doing at this hour a month ago or a year ago? Nobody will have any idea. Um, uh, questionnaires or survey instruments are also, I think, widely known. And these require a lot of uh, advanced preparation. And uh, you know, it, it, the steps are typically to think about the questions that you must get answered. Um, look for other surveys that have asked similar questions so that you don't have to reinvent them. And then that also means you can compare the answers that you get to prior uh, 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 survey research. And that can help you understand how, how the sample that you uh, queried uh, is similar to or different from others. Um, then there's going to need to be a, some pre-testing to find out whether the questions that you want to ask are answerable in the time allotted. And 
often people find, well, that's not the case. I asked way too many questions or too many of them were open-ended or they, they were ambiguous. And so pretesting is hugely valuable. Um, questionnaires are also good for, you know, unlike the how and why questions that you can get answered from a, an interview, uh, what and when questions are great things to ask in a, in a, a survey instrument or questionnaire. Okay, and then there are a variety of participatory methods uh, that are uh, in increasing use. And here are three examples uh, that we talk about in the book. You know, one is uh, relying on crowdsourced data. And in, in this case, it's asking people to upload pictures of, you know, of their apartments or their, or their um, offices to uh, better understand what they think is important about um, uh, the, their occupant experience. Another is folk labeling, where you ask people to describe, well, how do you think the HVAC system works and is controlled in this building? And then uh, there's a variety of strategies for um, uh, eliciting uh, information using thing, tools like wireless voting. And here's an example of um, asking uh, different members of the occupant population, in this case, you know, whether you're male or female, um, uh, to say, well, you feel comfortable or uncomfortable, you know, smiley face or frowny face. And all of that can then be aggregated together. And so to, to sum up the self-reported and self-engaged methods, uh, these have use in a lot of the different stages of the building life cycle. Interviews are great at the early phases, but also all the way through. Focus groups can uh, be helpful during the design phase and in some cases, one or two of the other phases. Charettes belong in the early phases. Uh, VR, virtual reality, and visualizations of, of various types can be useful at certain points throughout the design process. Uh, questionnaires are useful early and late. They're useful in developing the conceptual design, but also in understanding how things are working post-occupancy. And then a lot of the others, diaries, ecological momentary assessments, which are basically when you text somebody and say, well, how are you feeling right now? And you know, on your on their phone, or social media posts and things like that, they pretty much are only useful in the post occupancy phase. Okay, um, there are also observational methods uh, for acquiring occupant data, and I, I won't go into quite as much uh, depth as I did for the others for for the previous set. But here's an example from our own work where we instrumented a living lab and uh, that meant that we were measuring uh, objectively, you know, uh, electricity use, um, uh, uh, temperature of the wall and of the air um, at different and at different heights within the room, uh, a variety of indoor air quality measures, uh, such as particulates, VOCs, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, measuring what's going on in the ducts uh, to understand how the, um, uh, the HVAC system is relating to the ambient conditions in the room, um, acoustic measurements, uh, measurements of lighting sensors uh, in terms of illuminance, and occupancy sensors. Uh, do we detect anyone's presence in the room? And it goes on and on. You know, there's plenty of things you can measure and a sensor for each. And this is an area that's exploded in recent years as um, decent uh, cheap sensors have become available. And then we can boil that down to insights, such as is shown on the right, of well, how many people are present in the building at different times of day and different days of the week. And so there are a variety of observational methods and the key thing to notice about them, you know, whether it's building sensors or occupancy counters or building management system logs or, or videography, they're all really only of use post-occupancy. And so that limits them 
uh, for the designer and lets you do some heroic measures that I'll talk about in a second. There's a final set of methods, um, which are called simulation methods for acquiring occupant data. And these are basically where we rely on models that we've calibrated with observed data from some building. And uh, so we think about how occupancy is, you know, the number of occupants, their demographics is a prerequisite for caring about actions of occupants, you know, where they decide to turn on a light or open a window, which is then going to change the state of the building. The light's going to be on, the window's going to be open, let's say, which then affects uh, building conditions. And that might trigger responses uh, because the air temperature will change or the sound level will change or the level of illuminance will change. Um, and that might spur further action. There will also be non-adaptive triggers uh, you know, related to, well, what's my work schedule that are also going to be important triggers of both occupancy and action. And so in putting all of this together, uh, you need to um, have data from some building that you then use in a modeling context to explore some what ifs, some hypotheticals. And so, you know, there's a variety of simulation methods. You know, the simpler version are the occupant behavior models. The more complex versions approach digital, digital twins, where we try to simulate the building as well as the occupants in a dynamic way so that they interact with one another. And uh, these are useful uh, for building design to see, well, can you design a user-friendly building, a building that makes occupants happy? Um, it's also useful in thinking about um, uh, the occupancy experience, you know, post-occupancy state, uh, as we try to think about how can we make the building work better? Uh, but these are challenging and they depend on us being willing to collect data from one building, use it in a modeling context, and hope that it's relevant for the de design phase of another building. And so there's a leap of faith that we go through in saying the insights are transferable from one population in one building to a future building that hasn't yet been built. Okay, I want to spend just a, a minute on uh, a special methodological concern, which is interface design. And if you think about it, the, it, the interfaces are what lies between the occupant and the building's systems. And some interfaces are extremely simple, that beautiful old light switch on the one side of this slide. We know if it's on or off, we get direct feedback because we can see the light and we can also see the position of the switch. Or the more elaborate interfaces, such as um, that uh, on my, uh, my home management system where I control the, the various uh, lights in my house, put them on different schedules, and um, I can turn them on and off remotely. And uh, that means, uh, that I'm now interfacing basically with a smartphone interface as the interface to my building. And so as we think about interface design, uh, just as we saw with uh, other um, applications uh, of occupant um, uh, data, there are qualitative approaches and quantitative approaches and mixed methods that blend these together. And uh, these are quite important. Uh, they're quite varied. A lot of them uh, draw on the experience of interface design and software these days, but uh, they also go back to the environmental psychology literature and people like Don Norman, um, who inspired a generation of people to try to make better interfaces uh, for the built environment. Uh, there's going to be a session devoted to this topic on June uh, 20th. And so I encourage you to take a look at that and um, 
uh, spend some time thinking about interfaces. Okay, um, moving on to the occupant to professional relationship. There are a, a set of really important topics here that aren't things that uh, many professionals think are important, but it turns out they are important for occupants. One is, what is the philosophy of control that you are applying in this building? Are you offering local control over systems? Are you providing lots of thermal zones, for example? Um, or is it centralized control? And there are extremes here. You know? And I want to remind us that people's perceptions of comfort and satisfaction are in part related to how much control they think they have about the environment in which they're placed. And so uh, while the engineer in us might want centralized control because we can automate it and make sure it's done properly, there may be a case for more local control. People, the occupants may be happier and uh, you might be have a more adaptable building as a result. Also, uh, Usability is going to be a key part of the relationship. Are the systems that we're designing and their interfaces, are they comprehensible to occupants? Are they efficient and effective? Do you waste a lot of time trying to figure out how to do something simple? And if so, uh, it's not very usable. So we want to measure usability and think about it uh, critically. It's also important for the professional to be asking, well, which occupants am I talking about? You know, and uh, this is especially challenging for designers because you're inevitably borrowing your insights about occupants from other buildings that already exist. Or you're, um, and is that, does that make sense? Or should you rely on standards and client perceptions as being a more reliable uh, source of insight about occupants? Uh, there are strengths and weaknesses to both, but you'd better understand that. And often uh, there's value in learning from what's actually worked in other buildings and um, helping shape client perceptions in that regard. And finally, uh, there's a, a, an increasingly important question around, well, whose data are we using? Does this data belong to the building owner or its operator, or does it belong to the occupants? And um, something that we're seeing increasingly uh, in the uh, uh, air quality space, for example, is citizens buying their own indoor air quality monitors um, to say so that they know themselves whether it's good or poor air quality. And they're using that sometimes um, as a uh, cudgel against uh, building, uh, against landlords, for example, or building operators and owners who are not necessarily providing what they ought to provide. And so ownership of these data are an important thing to understand and finding useful ways to integrate um, occupant data um, that they think they own into better management of buildings is a hugely important task. Okay, um, a final topic I want to raise in this uh, presentation is data reduction. And it's great to collect lots and lots of data and to have zillions of sensors. But at some point, you have to turn those data into insights. And so you're going to go through some sort of data reduction process. And this can be done statistically, uh, you know, developing measures of central tendencies and measures of dispersion around um, uh, occupancy or, or thermal comfort preferences. And that's the, sort of the classic approach that people like Ole Fanger uh, used in developing predicted mean vote types of measures of thermal comfort. Um, but there are other ways that allow uh, us to use uh, richer data. And that's um, one example is this idea of developing personas. And these can be of various types, ideological types, uh, behavioral clusters, uh, preference profiles, and um, a, a nice four-step process for um, uh, doing that is illustrated here. So step one would be to develop descriptive statistics about 
the building and you know the measured energy use, the temperature profiles in the different zones. A second step would be to conduct a behavioral survey where we ask about people's temperature set points and what sort of um, adaptations do they engage in to ensure their own comfort? And when do they use the dishwasher or how long do they take a shower? All of those types of um, uh, behavioral measures. And then a third step would be um, interviews to understand the quantitative data and to understand people's attitudes and their beliefs and their needs regarding energy efficiency and um, using technology and um, level of comfort that they have. And um, uh, finally, uh, you boil it down with tools like um, affinity diagrams or personas where you characterize a small uh, uh, number of archetypes that represent behavioral clusters. And from that, you can um, uh, generate insights without um, being too burdened by all of the uh, uh, all of the data details. So to wrap this up, I want to make th three closing points. The first is that building designers and operators can learn a lot from occupants. What they can learn is going to vary by the stage of the building's life cycle. So you want to think about that all of that in the context of where you are in the uh, in your professional work. Second, the new skills that are needed to engage successfully in um, uh, working with occupants, these are skills that can be learned and they can be learned quickly. And there are a set of traditional methods that are used widely in social sciences, such as interviews and um, uh, surveys. And there are a bunch of new methods that rely on um, uh, uh, sensors and smartphones and so forth. And both of those can be uh, useful and uh, quickly, quickly used. And finally, uh, I think, uh, and I hope I've demonstrated that occupant-centric design approaches uh, that use these methods are going to improve a couple of things. They're going to improve the depth of insights that can be generated during the design process, and also the likelihood that we're going to see successful outcomes uh, for the owner of the building, the operator of the building, and the occupants who are in that building. All right, so I'll stop sharing and see if we've got any questions. We have one at the moment under the Q and A. Uh, that's from uh, Sui Chen Zhang about the data reduction you just mentioned. Uh, he's very interesting about that. So, which factor you choose to process to the next step based on this method? Yeah, that's a great question. And what I'd like to um, highlight is that, in fact, the data reduction is a process. It's going to involve several steps. And so the, the, the one that I illustrated just now um, did use um, statistical techniques to boil down data, find out you know what are the mean and the median and the mode and the standard deviation, and is there a skew in the data, all those types of things. But then um, we ex uh, explicitly did some triangulation. We married that to survey data to have people help us understand what's important, which, which are the important factors. And then we went further and had a, uh, interviews where we talked about all this. And we said, what do you think is important? And um, from that developed a small number of personas. And th the way I usually think about this is that there are a million ways to reduce data. Some of them are going to generate relevant insights. Some of them are just gonna be kind of fun to do, or maybe some of them are gonna be tedious to do as well. But what you want are 
um, insights that are relevant to the building's design and operation and um, occupant experience. And so it means using that set of contextual questions to do a particular type of data reduction that answers the questions that are that um, you need input on for that stage of your building's life cycle. Thank you. Hope this answer is okay for you, Chi Chen. Uh, any other question? Anybody have any question? You can either put your question under the Q&A or if you put your hand on, we probably can allow you lively ask a question directly. Any more question? We still have a, about uh, 10 minutes. Probably I ask a question, you turn. Yeah, Look, looks like these, uh, these kind of methods, you um, probably need to con concern a lot of different uh, uh, factors. And uh, did, did you design your research based on like a multidisciplinary uh, research methods with other researchers su such as from uh, uh, psychology uh, era or others, how, how, you, how you do that? Uh, yes, we definitely assemble multidisciplinary teams for our work, and we um, uh, uh, we almost always have um, uh, engineers, architects, um, uh, and either environmental psychologists or sociologists, or there are some people who are who are cross trained uh, and, and do applied versions of those. Uh, Disciplines, uh, so urban planners, for example, are often cross-trained in this way to understand um, the physical, you know, sort of physicality of the built environment, as well as how to elicit people's perceptions. And um, so I know I, I teach in an urban planning program, and in our core methods class, we spend a month on um, uh observing human behavior and eliciting people's subjective responses to to their environment. And so I think that's typical you know across these applied fields. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, authors of this of this edited book from which uh, this is this chapter is drawn are perfect examples. It's a very multidisciplinary mix. And um, part of it is, you know, learning to feel comfortable in that kind of a mix, you know, being part of a team of people who's who have different training and learning how to um, respect what they know and um, apply it to what you think you know. Yeah, thank you. We have a, a two more questions just coming in. Uh, one question asked about the monitoring is it instantly or you need small time gap um 10 minutes 15 minutes also yeah that, that's uh, that's an important question for, uh, especially if you're going into the design of sensor systems there are different phenomena that have different um, appropriate time steps and so a lot of this gets down to what question are you trying to answer and so i'll give you a couple of examples um, we have a current project where we are studying how do elderly people respond to summer uh, heat waves, uh, especially if they are uh, in a low income, uh, living in public housing and lacking uh, mechanical air conditioning systems. And so for that, we don't need... Um, to monitor temperature or humidity or occupant actions every 10 seconds, uh, something like once an hour is enough. But if we are measuring um, air quality and trying to understand what might trigger an asthma attack, um, then we need to understand the tremendous spikes in, let's say, particulate matter um, 
concentrations that will appear uh, in, in a home uh, during a cooking event or during a fire. And so for that, we want very quick response. There are some cases where we want to build that feedback right into the operation of the building. And so, you know, carbon dioxide sensors are the classic example where we want to have um, uh, demand, demand responsive ventilation systems for conference rooms. And so for that, um, it doesn't need to be in 10 seconds, but it probably needs to be about, you know, a minute or so uh, between uh, data collection uh, events. So it's all about fit for purpose um, time steps. Yeah, thank you. So basically different event, you need to think about the different approach. Thank you. And another question, um, oh, how do you control the bias during the interview focus group data collection? Yeah, that's uh, hugely important. And it's quite difficult. Uh, uh, the There are standard things that we do to um, try to minimize the potential for bias. Uh, so one is, uh, for example, I know that um, I, I, that if I ask a set of questions to a group of, um, let's say I'll pick uh, young women, they will likely answer differently to me than if a young woman answers uh, asks them the same questions. Um, and so well, we do think about uh, that uh, when we arrange interviews and focus groups. Who's the interviewer? Who's the focus group leader? Often we'll ha have a pair of people um, and put one person forward uh, versus another. Uh, another type of bias that often comes up um, has to do with um, what are reasonable occupant behaviors. And uh, uh, for example, someone who has um, an engineering degree and has worked for many years designing HVAC systems will know exactly what a thermostat ought to do and will be sometimes surprised when somebody in a focus group uh, thinks that thermostats work differently. And uh, so that's where uh, doing practice runs becomes important, pre-testing the interview protocol or the focus group protocol so that you can get some naturalistic responses to help you refine your questioning. And so uh, just looking at the uh, the, the second part of that question, do you take account of people's social uh, or demographic background? Uh, yes, we try to in both designing the um, instruments or the methods and the specific questions we ask, as well as who we put forward to do the interviews or, the, or lead the focus groups. There are limits to this, of course, which means that we need to retain humility because um, uh, it, there may be you know, no way to match interviewers to uh, occupant demographics. And so then we just, we need to be upfront and say, um, uh, I know your lived experience might be different than mine, but try to tell me uh, what your experience is and I will try to listen carefully. And I have that just bring that humility uh, to the to the project. Thank you. Uh, we still have uh, about four minutes left. I need one question. No. Oh, I probably ask another. You did mention about uh, during the design process stage, uh, you can use like a VR this kind of. Uh, innovative digital technology. Um, what's your experience? Because I did try, I'm not, not that kind of expert for VR, but I did try, it's a lot of challenge. So what are your experience and lessons you learn from that? 
Uh, was this in regard to VR specifically? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, any, any digital technology we want to use for this kind of uh, occupancy data collection. Yeah. Um, where I've seen VR be more useful is um, uh, in areas uh, where an approximate physicality is good enough. And so uh, something that we commonly do in urban planning, for example, is um, we put people into a, um, a virtual rea reality landscape in order to get their sense of, well, do you feel closed in by the canyon effect of the street wall? Or um, uh, can you navigate uh, clearly? Do you need landmarks to navigate with? And VR is OK for that. And you don't need a huge amount of realism. It's good enough to have kind of blocky cartoon buildings. Uh, um, uh, uh, similarly, uh, if you are um, focusing on interface uh, uh, design issues, it can be a fairly simplified um, VR interface. You know, uh, the thermostat doesn't need to look exactly like a real thermostat as long as it has the operable controls and the, the readouts that evoke that thermostat. And that works fine. But that said, there's a lot of ways in which the VR doesn't capture the full experience. For, for example, we have a current project where we're exploring the safety of those electric scooters that you see in many cities of the world, where people mm -hmm. are riding around the streets and the sidewalks. And we've created a VR uh, simulator for that. What is it like to ride? And from that, we can glean a few things. We can see what people pay attention to, you know, where are their eyes fixating, but we are completely missing all of the other senses that people use, the sense of uh, sound, of smell, uh, uh, the bumpiness of the pavement, all those other features, which are so important for mm -hmm. the safety experience of, of using those technologies. And so for those, it, it, it's, it's pretty useless. Um, I think it's challenging in the aesthetic context as well. So that's a short answer. That's you know, one take. That, that's, that could be a great topic for a future uh, webinar, in fact. This is a yeah. area. Yeah, a lot of things we can discuss, but currently maybe we'll keep it simple and uh, let it do the function. Yeah. Okay, I think time is approached to the end. Uh, thank you again, Sutton uh, Kangming, to do this presentation. Uh, and uh, also thank you for all of the participants from around the world. You may be evening time, morning time, lunch time. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, we draw a close now. Okay. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye.